got through verse 16 last time. Let's go on to verse 17. Now, just refreshing you, Revelation 19 is the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ over all his enemies on our behalf. And so far, we've seen uh, basically fireworks, uh, joy, celebrations in heaven over the victory, and God's judged the great harlot, the false church, and then Jesus comes on the white horse, verse 11, with all his angels with him to tread the winepress of the wrath of God the Almighty, which is to crush underfoot all of his enemies. And so now we're on to uh, verse 17, Jesus being King of kings and Lord of lords. He says, uh, John writes, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly in mid-heaven, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who sits upon the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who in its presence had worked the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. And the rest were slain by the sword of him who sits upon the horse, the sword that issues from his mouth. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Wow. Wow. Powerful verses. Quite dreadful, but glorious in the good and in the right. For this is judgment unto all God's enemies. But devastating and glorious and mighty is the victory over his enemies, God's glory over his enemies. So, the angel standing in the sun, so up there in the clouds, as if speaking from the heavens with glory and light pouring out all about him. And with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly in heaven, and come gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, captains, horses, with the riders, and the flesh of all men, etc. This imagery is found throughout the Bible, actually, uh, if you think of it. Um, let's see if I can find some verses here. Uh, look, for example, at David and Goliath. When... Uh, David stands against Goliath. Yes. The Philistines said to David, Come and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field, he roars. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Yes. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and trough your dead, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear but a battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. So in ancient times and probably modern times too you don't clean up so much after the battle. The birds do the cleaning. And they come, and it's it's like uh, you throw chicken parts into the sea from the factory, a chicken factory on the cliff. What gathers around the base of the cliff are the sharks. They come every day, and they clean up the ocean. Same thing after a battle between men on the surface of the earth. It's the birds that come and eat the corpses, the, the slain of the day's battle. Here, the angel... A mighty angel of God standing in the sun as if speaking from heaven with the glory of heaven behind him. Speaks to the earth. Speaks to all the birds of the earth. And gathers said, basically gathering all the birds of the earth. There's a huge battle about to take place. Come and eat your fill of the slain of the Lord. That's quite interesting language too. All the birds are going to be gorged with their flesh. Gorged is an interesting translation. I, I didn't look at the original Greek word, 
but it's a great English word. Gorged means basically filled to the full to the brim. You can't put in anything else. And so um, you can see that language in David versus Goliath. You can see that language, for example, in Ezekiel 39 even more accurately. Um, if I can turn there to Ezekiel 39, verse 19 reads like so. Uh, God's going to restore the fortunes of Israel, etc. And then verse... Okay. Uh, and I will not hide my... Ezekiel 39. 39, verse 19. That's my problem. Okay. Um, well, let's read from verse 17. As for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to the birds of every sort, and to all the beasts of the field, assemble and come and gather from, from all sides to the sacrificial feast which I am preparing for you, a great sacrificial feast upon the mountain of Israel, and you shall eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty, of the mighty, and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats, of bulls, of all of the fatlings of Bashan, and shall eat fat till you are filled, and drink blood till you are drunk at the sacrificial feast which I am preparing for you, and shall you shall be filled at my table with horses and riders, with mighty men and all kinds of warriors, says the Lord God. Sounds exactly the same as Revelation, mm -hmm. except Revelation is taking Old Testament imagery and verses of Scripture which are going to have their fulfillment in time, but especially at the end of time, and in the most culminating explosion of exhilarating fulfillment of Scripture that there could possibly be on the last day. For those slain by the Lord shall be many at the end of time. Remember a few weeks ago I preached on how narrow is the door to heaven. And most people think, oh, it's very wide. It'll be easy to get in. But Jesus says, I'm the door. There's only one way. You've got to enter by me to be saved. Otherwise, you try to do it another way. You're a thief. You're a robber. You're not getting in. A lot of people are going to be quite surprised on that day. Because notice, they're deceived in these verses. They're deceived by the beast. That's why they, they take the mark of the, of the beast, etc. So we'll read it in just a moment. But uh, one more verse, no, two more quickly, Isaiah 24, 21. Isaiah 24, 21, right here. It's there if you wish, 24. Uh, 21. It says, On that day the Lord will punish the host of heaven and heaven and the kings of the earth on the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit, and they will be shut up in a prison, and after many days they will be punished, etc. And one more, Psalm 110, verse 5, and then we'll go on. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment again among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ in that psalm, actually, in prophecy. You guys that? Is this the Battle of Armageddon, though? Yeah, I would say so. It's the final battle of the world, which is also referred to um, in, in chapter 16. But remember, of course, we're looking at the end of the world in Revelation multiple times. The last chapters and the final end of the world. Correct me, it's not really a battle, is it? It's an execution. We're going to get that. Yeah, that's so true. So true. Yeah, that's one of my next questions here. Um, by the way, in the Concordia Study Bible, since we're LCMS Lutherans, let's, let's let them speak a little bit too. Uh, I like this. It says, This supper of the birds eating the, um, the wicked, the rebel, rebels of the Lord, to, against the Lord, this supper stands in stark contrast to the brilliant marriage supper of the Lamb, lamb with his saints described previously in this chapter. So there's a huge feast at the end of time. But for us, it's marvelously joyous. For them, it's to their utter chagrin and terror. They are the feast. It's, they are the feast in that case. Yeah. <laughs> okay, who comes to fight against the king in this case? You've got what? You've got the beast. Um, the beast. The beast. I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who sits upon the horse and against his army. The one who sits upon the horse, the white horse, we've seen previously, is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. With his army, 
principally the angels, I believe, although he also comes with the saints. But it's principally his angels that do the executing of vengeance with him. And it's the beast. Who is the beast? The beast is Antichrist. Captured, and with it the false prophet, who is also Antichrist. The two work together. These are the same people we've seen throughout the chapters since Revelation 13. A beast that rises out of the sea, which is the kingdoms of the world, Antichrist. The beast that rises out of the, out of the land, which is the pseudo-false church, Antichrist. And the two work together in consort throughout the history of the world until the final day. These are gathering to make war on the Lamb, with all the armies of the earth, namely the peoples of the earth. Everybody's coming against the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, as we're going to see in the next chapter, it's Satan who's stirring this up. But we don't really see him behind the scenes until the next chapter kind of pulls up a few more of the, the curtains and you see who's behind. He's the puppet master who's really leading the beast and the false prophet, who's really leading the nations of the earth. So there's puppet masters. He is the puppet master. He's the one causing all wickedness and evil. And so that's pretty interesting, isn't it? To come against the Lord Jesus Christ shows you truly, surely must not know him. You don't know him very well, do you? Says Bugs Bunny. He don't know me very well, does he? Do he? Uh, because if you try to come against the Lord Jesus Christ, you're in trouble. Because all authority and power in heaven and on earth has been given to him. This is reminiscent of Psalm 2. Uh, why do the nations conspire and the kings plot in vain? They set themselves in array and have to come against the Lord in this. Oh, I messed it up. I, I know this psalm. I can recite it, but I just threw myself off there slightly. But um, it's reminiscent of Psalm 2, which says, um, why, why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth, as we see here, set themselves and the rulers take counsel again, together against the Lord and his anointed. His anointed is Messiah, Mashiach, the Christ. Let us burst their bonds of center and cast their cords from us. We will be our own gods, as Satan tempted in Eden. We will rule ourselves. Let's get rid of the trappings of following this God who calls himself the God of all things and Jesus the Savior. He who sits in the heavens, what's his response to this? <laughs> he laughs at them. He laughs at their piddly attempt at rebellion and attacking him. Because truly, you've got to be insane to attack the Lord. The Lord has them in derision. He laughs at first, but not for long. His laughter turns to a grim stern consternation against them. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you can read the rest of the psalm. Uh, God counsels them in that psalm, quickly make amends and come to peace with me or be destroyed. But if you come and take refuge in me, blessed are you. You'll be safe. You'll be in good hands. I'm a merciful king. So this is what we're seeing in this place. So all the world we're seeing right now is certainly, except for Christians, uh, basically marshaling their forces against the Lord in this church right now. Yes. As we've never seen. We've seen certainly attacks on the church throughout church history, but have we ever seen it in such a worldwide scale as at this day? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so it kind of seems like it could be starting to get fulfilled here now. It's not for us to know the times and seasons. That's for the Lord to know. It's for us to find out. But we can make general... Uh, God does encourage us to make general uh, assessments of the signposts of history to know generally how close we're getting. So it says, when you see these things take place, you know that he's near. Just like the fig tree. So we should be checking out and discerning the times but also not putting our final word down as if we know when he's coming, because it's uh, like a thief in the night. But I would say these things seemingly are coming to pass in the final chapters of history, and we could have decades left, I don't know. But it certainly seems not too long. At any rate, 
So the birds are going to eat all flesh, by the way. There's, there's kings, there's captains, there's generals, and there's corporals and privates. I mean, it's everybody, slave and free here. They're all coming against God, Jesus, uh, and his army. And the beast was captured in chapter 20. So, uh, let me say this then. Describe the throes of this battle. It's engagements. It's maneuvers. It's a route. It's, it's a route. There's not even a battle at this point. It's the great battle. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've often said this. If this were a movie, and you've been watching the whole history of the world up until now, you'd think, you know, at the end of Braveheart or some other movie like that, there's always some, well, Braveheart didn't end so good, but uh, there's always like this big clash and all the armies and everybody's running around and there's the, the great hero fights the great foil to himself and all this stuff. And you'd expect clashes of swords and this maneuver and these running here and there and, and duking it out and con contesting of strength. None of that really goes on here. The kings of the earth, with all of their armies, and the false prophet, gather to make war. They come against the Lord, and he obliterates them. Over. It's just, it's, there's, there's no battle. It's a, totally it's a route. It's a total devastation. And there's not one arrow uh, wound on any of the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not even anything gets through. He just plows them over. And I've written in my own notes personally, it's as if a paper army charges into a furnace. It's over. Or, um, how else did I describe it? Um, oh, it's as if the armies of darkness are charging into a room. If we could turn all the lights off right now. And it's as if you just go over and flip on the light switch. And the darkness is gone. <clears throat> in, in the twinkling of an eye. I mean, all the forces of darkness marshal against the Lord, and all he does is show up, and they're instantly obliterated. How? By his own sword, and his sword is his word, which proceeds out of his mouth sharper than any earthly two-edged sword, that pierces to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and discerns even the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Therefore, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus, and when he comes, he will give each man his commendation according to his work. All right. So, the beast was captured. <laughs> nice try. Didn't work at all. Not even a try. It doesn't even work at all. The beast was captured. That's Antichrist, who is giving us some trouble these days. But this is, this is written of him, and so let it be written, so let it be done. As it was in the Pharaoh movie, right? The king with, uh, what was the guy's name, Yul Brenner? Yeah. So let it be written, so let it be done. Well, it's been written, so shall it be done. The beast will be captured. This troublesome beast that's waxing, vaunting himself against the Lord right now, seemingly so strong. In a little while you look again and you'll say, where was this tall cedar of Lebanon? I looked again well at his place and I find him not. He's been vanquished. He's disappeared. And you are exalted. He's under your feet. Take a look down. You shall tread upon, upon all the forces of the enemy. And with it the false prophet, who in his presence had worked the signs by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. So we just saw the destruction of the harlot in the previous chapter. Revelation 18, here we see her again, a uh, false prophet, the, the, the wolf in sheep's clothing that's masquerading right now in the world as a Christian and promoting I as a they and a they as an I and a he as a she and a she as an, is, a, is a he and, and we're all it's and it's are he's and everything's confusion with the Antichrist and he'll get away with whatever he can get away with. He couldn't have gotten away with us in the 60s, but he's, he's cooked up the temperatures hot enough that he can say the most outrageous things now, and somehow some of the world's buying it, although a lot of people don't. Even unbelievers don't buy a lot of that stuff. But he deceives them far enough that he's worked signs, remember, 
supernatural pretended signs and wicked miracles by the power of Satan. That doesn't mean they don't have supernatural charges to them. And he's not really doing stuff. Some are pretended miracles. Some are actual, real, supernatural miracles, but not of God. So if anybody comes along in the world to come, in history, in our future, while we're on this earth, and someone starts working some sort of miracle, like maybe he makes a, you know, a, a, a chair float like Yoda or something like that from Star Wars, don't believe it. You go ahead and, ahead and ask him, but what is your confession of Jesus Christ? If they start pretending and telling you, aliens, they're going to come and save us from the COVID-19. Don't believe it. What is your confession of Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. Be prepared for signs and wonders, because he deceives those who are not of the Lord. He deceives those who receive the mark of the beast, and those who worship its image. Mm -hmm. Remember, that's especially Revelation 13. You have a mark on your forehead or on your hand. You follow the, the Antichrist with your will and mind, and with your hand and your actions. Could there also be a physical manifestation? I've always said this, I'll say it again. There's a possibility there could be a physical manifestation of this toward the end of time. But the mark of the beast has been around for all of history, because unbelievers are always following the beast, Antichrist. Believers are always following the lamb. You can only have one of two Marks. You can't have both at the same time. Isn't that a good news? So if you're a Christian, you can't and you won't succumb to the mark of the beast, but you also got to be careful not to do so because he comes against you with a, his teeth bared, like iron teeth, but you also need to resist him, firm in your faith. Knowing the same experience of suffering is required of your brotherhood throughout the world, and after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace will himself restore, establish, and strengthen you, says Peter, in Jesus Christ. So, uh, the mark of the beast, and those who worship this image. Now, the vaccine is not the mark of the beast, okay? So if you, I, I recommend against the vaccine, as you know, a thousand percent, I always have from the beginning. If you have any questions about that, please talk with me personally. However, uh, don't let it destroy your conscience or anything like that because uh, it's not the mark of the beast because Christians have taken it, all right? And uh, I know there are people that are saying that there right now, but there is a remarkable similar language uh, being used when it comes to, unless you have a vaccine passport, which is in the works, especially in Europe, coming to America, coming to a country near you soon, where you won't be able to go here, go out of the country, you can't travel, you can't go to ball games, you can't work. Many people are losing their jobs today because they won't get the vaccine, etc. So the language is very similar, isn't it? So I would be careful about, you know, if you've had the vaccine, just say, that's enough. One was enough, no more, because they're going to try to push more and more and more of these things at you continually down through the next, they've already got a Delta variant and then they're gonna have a, another variant and another variant and another variant until they want, they've already said they wanna do this every six months to a year, give you more. I would say, if you've had one, count yourself blessed, don't get any more. If you haven't had one, don't get one. And, and let's just be happy, follow the Lord and et cetera. But I'm just care, care, uh, careful that the language they're using is remarkably similar to what we read in scripture and I don't want to go anywhere near anything that is remarkably similar to something that's bad <laughs> in scripture so uh, let's just not go that route anymore if you've already done that route. Yeah, question? I was going to say that the second variant of COVID has you now appeared. I could have told you that was going to happen. Oh yeah. How yeah. many more, you know? Yeah, yeah. If you listen to the Rockefeller plan from 2010 of how to take over the world. If you've looked at the, the Vent 201 and all this stuff. If you look at the president of Ghana from Africa, he lays out, um, if you've seen that video, he lays out very clearly the whole globalist elite world takeover plan of the Great Reset. And he says, basically, you've gone through stage one. They're going to lighten up for the summer. They're going to hit again supposedly harder in the fall, try for a harder lockdown. And it's all part of a five-stage plan to basically take over the world. 
And uh, I love that guy because he's so Christian. I don't really know him. I just saw this one video. He's, awesome. he's like, in your case, he is trying to do this to you. And God judge between him and us. I mean, he's just like, mm. I'm like, yeah, go get him. It's good stuff. Um, is so, he, is he yeah. assassinated yet? I don't know. I don't know. Has he? I, know. I know that they killed, uh, who is it, um, yeah. McAfee this last week. Right? He was suicided because he was going to release some information on the deep state, supposedly. And he says, by the way, just so you know, in case I'm killed, he had, I think he had tattooed on him. I, I did not suicide myself or something like that. If you find me dead in prison, I didn't do it. <laughs> he was found dead this last week, so I don't mean to be flippant about someone's life. But at any rate, uh, we have to be ready, personally, um, to, to resist the death. Uh, the Antichrist, don't we? Yeah. Yep. So uh, they they love not their lives even unto death, and we conquer by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. And uh, you've not met, yet resisted the point of shedding your blood, it says in the letter to the Hebrews. But we may have to do that at some point, potentially. On the other hand, I think there's a lot of hopeful things coming to America. I see an amazingly great bunch of good things going on in our country share some of that on Sunday. Uh, so who knows the times and seasons? We could have a couple hundred years left. Fight the good fight. Uh, be happy. Be peaceful. Uh, be free. And submit not to any of the works of Antichrist, because he's our enemy. Our king is the true God and king, Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, okay, so what happens to these guys? These two the beast and the false prophet, were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. And the rest were slain by the sword of him who sits upon the horse, the sword that issues from his mouth. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. So, quick battle. Total rout. Full destruction of all enemies. Total victory. God gets rid of the bad guys, which is a beautiful thing. And into the lake of fire that burns with brimstone, which is probably a literal fire, but it also, we're dealing with symbolic language here. It simply means everlasting torment, everlasting destruction. Fire is a symbol for destruction in the Bible. Now, if you've uh, cremated your loved one's remains, as a lot of people have, don't let that also bother your conscience, please. God will raise your loved ones in the Lord. That Everybody's going to be raised. You can't avoid it. Nevertheless, I do encourage and strongly guide and always have burial for a Christian. Okay? Because that's the way Christ was buried and raised on the third day. Christians have always buried their dead. Abraham was buried, etc. So I always say burial, burial, burial. Some people listen, some don't. But even if you don't, uh, let that not trouble your conscience. God's going to raise your loved one and then the Lord. But please uh, consider and talk with me about that. Uh, which Christians bury? Okay. Huh? And brimstone associated with divine judgment. Yes, yes, the brimstone on divine judgment, he says. And so that's uh, rem reminiscent of Sodom and Gomorrah, which was a preview of the coming attraction of the last day. They serve as, as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Uh, those two cities and the surrounding ones, whom God poured fire and brimstone straight down from heaven to destroy them by the hand of the angels. I visited a lot. So that's uh, pointing forward to the final day. Jesus says, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, and then the day, also the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. It's going to come unexpectedly in a moment, and it'll be a total overthrow. So, uh, yeah, so, and all the rest were thrown into the same place. The rest were sl slain by the sword. So there's a mighty sword. It's Excalibur, but it's better than Excalibur. King Arthur had that one, and no one could defeat Excalibur. It was a special sword. Well, Jesus' sword is better by far. It's the Word of God. It's what comes out of his lips. Remember, Jesus says, I don't, didn't come to judge the world, and I don't judge you. It's my Word that shall be your judge on the last day. And the Word, specifically, is the Gospel, which you hear a few verses earlier. I think it's Luke 12. <clears throat> I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. So, uh, people who reject the Lord and his word shall be judged by the Lord and his word and uh, found 
wanting and and they'll be destroyed uh, but it'll be an everlasting destruction as we know from other places not annihilation but eternal torment as we see also in the next chapter so here we see kind of like the physical destruction of the people and their bodies are thrown away we see more of the spiritual ramifications of these things I think more in Revelation 20 but here too okay should we go on a little bit now this next part is deep <laughs> and uh, there are some varied views on this I'll tell you what I believe is the right interpretation of Revelation 20 uh, however um, we're going to be at variance here with some of evangelical Christianity, namely, especially Baptists and some Evangelicals and some Pentecostals. But let's take a look at it. Huh? In, in verse 20, you made a good point there about, and, you know, these, these were thrown alive. Thrown alive! So, yeah. this is, they're not dead. Mm. They're alive. So, there's... Great know, it's, point. It's a point that this is eternal uh, uh, torment. Right, and and I love how wonderfully you covered my mistake and complimented me as if I said that. <laughs> Can you really, repeat what you just said? Yeah, I did say it in general, but I mean, this is true. In this line, it says they were thrown alive into the lake of fire, meaning they weren't dead and then thrown in. They were, th they were captured and thrown alive in there, being in eternal conscious yeah. anguish, eternally in the... Not only the prison and outer darkness from away from the presence of the Lord and His light and all life and joy, but also uh, everlasting weight of the wrath of God resting upon them. Jonathan Edwards, if you ever read Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God, uh, talks about that, how you're dangling like a, a spider on a little string over fires, but if you sink down into there, you'll sink like a stone in the sea, and the pressures of eternal wrath heavily upon you forever, unbearable torment. Of course, he, he led people to repentance with that sermon. That's a good <laughs> use of the law. <laughs> and uh, maybe we need more of that in our day. Because we need to know the truth of these matters. You don't want to water these things down, and God forgive me for, if, uh, for I've done that. I'm going to do the best I can to give you the word straight and clear. This is the truth. All right, verse chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient servant who was called the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him. That he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be loosed for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom judgment was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Less than holy is he who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. All right. How am I going to get through all this in the matter of a few minutes before communion? Because this is, this is so key. This is so important. This is so marvelous. We'll hit it again next week. We can hit it again next yeah. week. We'll get as far as I can and say we'll do ten minutes. See what we can do. Okay. So... Um, what do we read here? Uh, Satan, and then thrones, and people coming to life, and then, uh, and then ultimately in verse 7 and following, we're going to see a whole big end times battle again. All kinds of thousands and thousands of people coming against the Lord and his people surrounding the camp of the saints. Uh, I thought we just got rid of those people in Revelation 19. And Revelation 14 and Revelation 18 and other places. This is another angle on the same event. This is where you're going to get a real variance with the premillennialist teachers. But could this be in heaven, not on earth? 
Well, it's in spiritual realms, the Satan part. Yeah. But what we're going to see in verse 7 and following, which we didn't read, is they're going to march up over the earth and surround the camp of the saints, the beloved city, the Christians, the church, perhaps also Jerusalem. Um, and, uh, and then they're going to be destroyed again. And then you're going to see Satan cast into the same place where the beast and the false prophet are, the burning fiery lake. He'll be its chief prisoner, as my grandma used to say. So don't think of the devil as the king of hell. He's its chief prisoner. That's what my grandma Kittrell used to say. That's a good one, isn't it? Yeah. Chief prisoner. Uh, let's just let's just go just a little way into this, because I really it's so deep in terms of making sure we understand this properly. And if you listen to the radio, you're going to hear the alternative view. So let's just go over this briefly. Alright, you might have to widen your lens here. Let's swim this up. I'll just describe it, and then we'll analyze it more next week. So once again, we're going to have two varying views of these verses. On our side, this is this is what we believe over here. Christ came down from heaven, died on the cross. Oh, I just messed up my perfectionistic cross. I know I touched it. Okay, Christ came down, died for our sins, rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven, and He's at the right hand of God, ruling on behalf of His church with all authority and power. Sorry, can you see this? Yeah. He's ruling. All authority and power has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations. We are in the church age where the gospel is spreading to the end of the world. Remember, it's going to reach the end of the world before the end, and then the end comes. Uh, and meanwhile, if you die before Christ comes again, if you're dead, your spirit goes to hell while your body goes into the earth. If you're a believer, your body goes to the earth, your spirit goes to be with Christ in heaven. At the last day, Christ is going to come again on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory to judge the earth. This is what we're talking about here. Destroy the wicked, destroy the devil, destroy all the minions of Satan and uh, all that wickedness and evil. He will judge the great right throne of judgment. Later on in Revelation 20, the wicked are sent into everlasting darkness, away from the presence of the Lord, the burning fiery lake. The believers receive the new heavens and the new earth, in which righteousness dwells and crowns and reign with him in glory and eternal joy and life. Pretty simple, right? So the thousand years that we're reading of here, we believe, is to be taken symbolically, just like the rest of Revelation. Namely, of a long period of time in which Christ is ruling. And we're going to explain more about this first resurrection of the dead and all that stuff next week. That's what we believe. Over on this side, what you're going to see is, interestingly enough, they're going to read Revelation 19, have the battle conclude... And then they have to start over again since they're reading it chronologically with a thousand years being way over here. Let me write that down. They're going to say the thousand years is, has to be read after Revelation 9, 8, after Revelation 19 because it's the next chapter. It must be later on. So the thousand years is after the end of the world. Make sense? Because you have the end of the world. You have the end of the world in Revelation 19. We just finished that. Revelation 20, there's going to be a thousand years where Christians are ruling with Christ. So if you're going to read it chronologically, as if Revelation 19 happens before Revelation 20, then they're right. You'd have to have the end of the world, and then another thousand years after that, and then another battle. Whereas what I've been saying constantly through this whole Revelation series is we're looking at the end of the world at least seven times in, in, in Revelation. Which means you're looking at it from this angle, this angle, this angle, this angle. Revelation 19 is this angle. Revelation 20 is this angle. It's the same events. Otherwise, you're going to have to have the world end seven times, at least. Either that, or you're looking at the same events from different directions. So, I believe we're correct in looking at it this way. What you're going to, I'll just describe this and we'll conclude for tonight. We'll, we'll go over Revelation 20 more next week and see which one of these is correct. So, on this side is what you're going to hear on the radio. Most of the time. 
Unless you listen to R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul agrees with us, Ligonier Ministries, and, other, and, a, and a number of others, but generally not as many on the radio. Uh, well, let's go here. Um, so what you're going to hear is they all agree with us. Christ came from heaven, took on flesh, died for our sins, rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven. We're in total agreement with the evangelical. He's ruling at the right hand of God. We're in agreement. This is the church age. We're in agreement. But here's where we vary. Toward the end of time, they believe that there is going to be a rapture uh, where Christ comes down to earth. Up here. Okay. There it is. Okay, Christ comes down to earth, but not the whole way. 1 Thessalonians 4. He returns to catch up the saints that are on the earth. So the church, if you're living on earth at this point, you meet him in the, in the air. He doesn't come all the way down. It's an invisible return. Whereas we're talking about what kind of return at Christ's return? Visible. What? And audible with the, with the sound of the trumpet. But they're looking at an invisible second return of Christ. A rapture where, now this is the common view. There's some variations. There's a pre-tribulation rapture, mid-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture. <laughs> but this is the most common one you'll see, at least on the radio for the most part. So Christ comes, caught up to meet him in the air. You're raptured, you're caught up. And then the rest of the earth, the unbelievers are left behind. Hence, so you get the left behind move books and move movies, right? At this point begins what they would say from Daniel chapter 9, the seven-year tribulation of the where every all hell breaks loose, more or less. At this point, Antichrist appears. Interestingly enough, when does Antichrist appear on our belief of the world? He manifests himself down through the church age. We have to deal with him the whole time, although he has a special uh, revealing of his power toward the end of time. But we're, we're saying, you got to deal with him now. There's a wolf out there. They're saying, the wolf isn't out there. He appears after you're gone. Which one would you rather have? This one's more comfortable. This one's a little scarier. But if the wolf is really outside, which one do you want to know? If, we're, if this is like Little Red Riding Kids, whatever here right now, or we're out in the woods, and there's a real wolf prowling outside, and I say, don't play children, he's not going to arrive until next week, Tuesday. You'd be like, oh, let's play, and we're having a great time, but if the wolf is really there, you're in big trouble. Whereas if I'm telling you, be careful, you can go outside and play, but be very careful, if there's a wolf out there, it might be less comfortable, but you're in far better shape, because you're watching out for him. Invisible return, Antichrist appears, seven year tribulation, just to make it very brief here. Then, uh, as this is the first resurrection, we'll get to that. Then, after the seven years, Christ returns again. So you've got a second return of Christ, you've got a third return of Christ. He comes this time on the third go round. This was his first coming over here, his second coming, his third coming. He comes again, and this is where he establishes what, what they would say is a literal 1,000 year reign of Christ on earth. Where, where you're resurrected, you, you live, all the saints, it's total paradise on earth, everything's peachy keen, marvelous, a literal ruling on earth for a literal 1,000 years. You've got to ask him. How is it you're reading a thousand years literally when everything else you just been reading was symbolic? Just explain to me why. If you can prove it to me, I'll believe it. But why did you jump to literal all of a sudden? Yes. And how do we know it's one thousand years when we don't know it? Well, in, in the Bible it says you don't know the hour. Yeah, you don't know the hour. That's an interesting point because it does say here a thousand years that Satan's bound and a thousand years they reign. So that's where they get it. But also, that would tell you when Christ is going to return the fourth time, really, the last time, to finish off the, the devil. Well, so you'd know, oh, I know how long it is. In fact, I know how long it is right here. Uh, right, let's get ready. No. Seven years. I know it's coming in seven years. 
No, wait a second. You can't know the day or the hour. Well, how about when we get to here? A thousand <laughs> years from now. Exactly. So anyway, uh, so there's a problem here too. One more, and then we'll conclude. Is if Christ is reigning on earth for a thousand years, and it's peachy keen paradise, and everything's marvelous and wonderful, and there are only believers on earth, and all things are great, where do you get a billions of wicked people again? Because at the end of this thousand year reign, they're going to say there's a, the whole earth is filled with wicked people again. They march up and surround the camp of the saints and God has to destroy them again. I'm saying, if only believers are on earth, and they're all resurrected, and they're wonderful people, and it's all paradise, how do you get wicked people again? And the only place you can get them is from godly people, the resurrected saints. In fact, it doesn't sound like much paradise to me. If you have bad guys around, and frankly, a lot of the good guys became bad guys. Mm. That would not be a good thing. No. So I don't believe this one. I believe this is wrong, but that's what you're generally going to hear. God bless them. I love all these people, but, you know, Calvary Chapel and a lot of the Baptist churches and certain evangelical churches and certain non-denominational churches. Don't they also say it's only going to be 144,000 that are raptured? Well, no, the 144,000 are going to appear here as Jewish evangelists. Okay, that's it. Because after the rapture of the church, they say more people get saved. Wait, how do people get saved if there's nobody on earth that's a believer? Oh, well, God raises up 144,000 Jews who then start to evangelize the world. And if you watch the movie with Kirk Cameron, uh, when they get raptured and Christians all disappear out of planes and buses and things, and Kirk Cameron's one of those who's left behind, how do they know the gospel and get saved? Wait a second. Didn't our pastor tell us this was going to happen? Yeah. He said if we ever disappear, we're supposed to do something. What was it? Oh, he left us a videotape. And they go get one of the beta uh, VCR tapes. Of course, they'd have trouble now. It's DVD. Anyway, but he gets a, a tape of, uh, and he puts it in the machine, and, and the pastor comes on. If I'm not here, I have been raptured. This is what you are to do. I mean, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 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 so, I, I don't mean to make fun or of that of, of, of people, because I love all our Christian brothers, but I do not go along with false teachings. I just can't do that. So, I believe that is a false teaching, for the number of reasons we've talked about. But we got to interpret Revelation 20 properly, which we'll do next week, and I'll show how I believe it is teaching us this over here. So, we'll take a look at that next week. Any questions? God's blessings to you. All right. Good. 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 Good